Genesis chapter 21, a continuation of Ronnie's lesson from last week. Um, and we'll start reading in verse 11 of chapter 21, but just in case uh, you weren't here last week or you forgot, I'm going to recap a little bit of what happened last week because it leads into what happened in this week's lesson. After years and years and years of promising Abraham that he would have a seed that God would make into a great nation, that he would have an heir, Isaac was finally born. Right. And when he's two years old, after he has survived what was the most dangerous part of childhood, um, if you know, somebody was going to die in childhood back in those days. It happened in those first two years. After he had made it to that point and was weaned from his mother's breast, Abraham calls a great feast. And uh, at that feast, Ishmael, Abraham's first son, of course, by Sarah, his wife's handmaid, Hagar, Ishmael is caught mocking Isaac. Uh, that. The word that's translated here as mocking in King James is a little bit difficult to translate. Other translations have it as making fun or making sport or laughing at, but basically you get the idea of what's going on here. And it just sets Sarah off. She had already had it out for Hagar, you'll remember, from the time she conceived Ishmael, uh, even though, I mean, it was Sarah's idea right. from the beginning. She dealt with her harshly. You remember we had that lesson. Dealt with her so harshly that Hagar flees into the wilderness while she's still pregnant. It's there that she's met by the angel of the Lord uh, who appears to her and tells her to go back to Abraham's house and makes a promise to her that... Now, this is Hagar here is the first person in the Bible to be met by an angel. And she is the first woman to receive a promise like this in the entirety of the whole Bible. The angel tells her to go back and that Ishmael also will be a great nation someday. So now about 16 years have gone by. And things have not changed. Sarah has finally this promised heir that God had, had promised for so many years and, and yet still has this hair trigger when it comes to Abraham's first son, Ishmael. Um, so she sees Ishmael mocking Isaac and demands that Abraham send Hagar and Ishmael away. That's where we find us in, in verse 11 of chapter 21 of Genesis. The thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son, meaning this request that Sarah had made was very upset Abraham. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondswoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For an Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child, and sent her away and departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot, for she said, Let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. So just going through that from, from the beginning, like I said, Sarah demands that Abraham send Ishmael and Hagar away. And it's grievous in Abraham's sight. It's heartbroken. Because even though Sarah has no love for Hagar and, and Ishmael, this is Abraham's son. But then God appears to him and says, do what Sarah tells you to do. Listen to your wife. He affirms to Abraham here that 
Through Ishmael, another great nation will be created because he is Abraham's seed. So Abraham gets up early that next morning and gives Hagar some bread and water and sends him into the wilderness. And the bread and water, because it's a desert, that area that they were traveling southeast from where um, Abraham is, uh, was camped, this wilderness of Beersheba is a, is a desert. There's nothing there. Um, I mean, it, it mentions some shrubs, but it's kind of like that desert scrub that you see in pictures. You know, it's, it's, it's a barren wasteland, nothing. They escaped that way, and soon, I mean, it wouldn't take long. How much water really could? Ishmael was probably 16 years old. Hagar was, I mean, who knows? She in her 30s or 40s. How much water could two people really hold? How much bread could they really carry? Yeah. The journey was long, and before too long, it's all spent. And uh, Hagar, evidently, Ishmael here is in a bad way because she perceives that he's going to die. And she lays him down under this shrub. Maybe she tells him, I'm going to go look for some water. But we really know what happens. She goes off so she doesn't have to watch him die. Can you imagine what kind of distress that would be for, for a mother to, oh, yeah. to, to lay their child down to die and not have any way to help. And the, the only thing you can do is remove yourself from the situation so you don't have to witness it happen. And she weeps. And just like happened chapters earlier when she had fled to the wilderness to escape Sarah, that angel of the Lord speaks to her again. And he says that this time, before it, it, the angel told Hagar that God had heard her cry, this time he says, I've heard the lads cry. Yeah. Ishmael means God hears. And he opens her eyes. So either a well of water miraculously appears in this desert, which totally could happen. God could have made that happen. Or God opens her eyes to see one that was nearby and she didn't notice yet. Either way, a miraculous thing happens here. I mean, you imagine wandering around in the desert. There was a story a couple of years ago about a woman that starved to death on the Appalachian Trail, and she was less than a mile from the trail. But she got out in that wilderness and got so turned around and confused that she sat there and starved to death when help was so close. So maybe that's what happened here. Maybe God opens Hagar's eyes to see something she hadn't seen. Either way, it's a miracle. And they drink. And survive. And Ishmael grows strong. He becomes an archer, it says here. Able to provide food for his family. He marries an Egyptian. Uh, somebody from his mother's lineage. Because that's where Hagar was from. And the next time we see Ishmael, after this story, he is returning to bury his father Abraham with his brother Isaac. Grows into a strong man and God keeps his promise and, and makes his descendants a great nation. Seemingly a happy ending to a, a story that could have easily gone the other way. But I guarantee you something. Until the day that Ishmael died, I guarantee you that he remembered that day with his mother in the desert. Yeah. Yeah. I'm certain that maybe even if he forgot, Hagar never forgot that day in the desert no. when she and her son almost died of thirst. And how they would have died if not for the intervention of God Almighty. Now, we don't know, though, if, if Ishmael knew the backstory. We don't know if, if he knew that it was Sarah that had requested that he leave. That God had told Abraham to go through with his wife's request. It's, and, and if you think about it, really, none of this story where, where Hagar and Ishmael almost died, none of this would have happened had God not told Abraham specifically to listen to your, what your wife is saying. Abraham could have just ignored, I mean, back in the, the, uh, uh, the uh, paternalistic society of that day, what the man said went. Abraham could have easily ignored Sarah, but God comes and, and says, send him out into the world. Yes. Now that's an uncomfortable thing to think about, thinking that God is behind this really harrowing experience that these two people had to go through. After all, God is siding with Sarah here, and Sarah is not exactly in the wrong. I mean, Ishmael did, or Sarah is in the wrong. Ishmael did mock Isaac, that's for sure. But have you ever met a 16-year-old boy? 
Yeah. I used to be one. Their social skills are just a little bit lacking. I can say that because, like I said, I used to be one. But, I mean, could you blame Ishmael? Uh, it reminds me of the, the story of the, the prodigal son, the end part of that story that we forget so often. Not everybody was happy when the prodigal son comes back home, were they? There was that elder brother who had stuck around and had been there through all that, those heartbreaking years when his younger brother had gone off and lived all that riotous living. His brother comes back and he sees this big party being thrown for him and he gets jealous because that's how we are. And no doubt Ishmael probably felt the same way. Here's his little brother. Remember the culture that they grew up in that time. The older son was it, man. Like that was what you needed to keep your lineage going. Your firstborn son. That's what was important. And here's Ishmael, the firstborn son, the rightful heir. And then his little brother comes along and his dad throws him a huge party just because he got weaned. Mm -hmm. I can see Ishmael. I mean, you can understand the position that Ishmael must have been in. Making fun of it. Yeah, yeah, little brother, good job. You started eating solid food. Let's throw a party. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, of course he's, of course he's upset because he sees this big to-do being thrown and that's not how things are supposed to go. No doubt he probably felt jealous. And we can't blame Hagar either because she's a slave, remember? She had no say when it came, when Sarah said, you should go have a baby with Hagar. Hagar could not protest that. She had no say in this matter. Ishmael didn't ask to be born into this, this situation. The only people you can blame for this messed up situation that's going on here is Sarah and Abraham. Those are the only people you can blame. And yet God is siding here with the prideful, hair-triggered one and says, yeah, do what Sarah says. Send them out into the desert where there's nothing to eat or drink. That's kind of uncomfortable to think about. But here's the thing. We experience our lives, and maybe this is evident to some of you, but it, but it blew my mind when, when I thought about it. We have a limited understanding of our own stories. We only know what happened up to this point and what is happening right now. We can only... The only thing we can draw on, and Hagar could draw on uh, about her story, was what had happened up to this point and what was happening in that exact moment. Yeah. But God <laughs> yeah. sees it all at once. Yeah. God knows what the beginning of the story is. He knows the middle of the story. And he knows the end of the story. God has the benefit, had the benefit of knowing how this story would end even before it began. Just like I've said before, people say, uh, and I don't want to get on next week's lesson, but it's about God telling Abraham to take Isaac to the mountain and offer him as a sacrifice. And people say, how in the world could God do something like that to somebody? Well, the thing about God is, He knew that ram was going to be caught in the thing. Oh, yeah. The thing about this story is, God always, that well was yeah. always going to be there. Yeah. That water was always going to be there. So although Hagar was stumbling through the wilderness, not knowing how this story would end, God had a well of water prepared for her yeah. in her hour of need. He knew that the story would have a happy ending because He had promised years before, 16 years before, that Hagar, He had promised personally to Hagar that he would multiply her seed and make a great nation. A promise that he reaffirms to Abraham here in chapter 21. And God does not break his promise. No. Now, you know, this could be one of those lessons where we go, well, it's Hagar's fault. She shouldn't have worried so much. Life looks scary. Just have faith and everything will be fine. I mean, you could say that. People say that. Those are, you know, they're greeting cards that say that kind of stuff. But that's not how life actually works. Let's be honest. Let's, I mean, put, I like to put myself in the shoes of, of these people in, in the Bible. How easy is it going to be when you are leaving everything you've ever known? Likely Hagar had lived in Abraham's household from the time she was a little girl. Yeah. She leaves everything and everyone she's ever known and says, go into the desert. The one you trusted to take care of you, Abraham, says, go into the desert. 
Here's a bottle of water and a loaf of bread. Maybe there was more than that, but it couldn't have been much more. How easy is it going to be for Hagar to trust that God is going to make all this stuff work out? Now, she had heard about God's faithfulness. She grew up in Abraham's household. No doubt from the time she was a little girl, Abraham had talked about the one true God that he served. Right. He, he had, she had no doubt seen these pagan gods, these, these gods who were nothing but supersized humans who were jealous and hateful. And, and these other pagan people, they had to always offer sacrifices lest they make their God mad and they would turn against them and kill all their family and ruin their crops. I mean, these, these gods of the other nations, these false gods, they were, they were just petty and and jealous, but Abraham, no doubt she had heard Abraham talk about this one true God who is so much better than any man, who is a one true king that, that you can always put your trust in. No doubt, she, I mean, she had been there as Abraham traveled and all these things that we read about in this first part of Genesis transpired. She had no doubt heard that God had promised that an heir to Abraham and Sarah even though they were super, super old and physically it would have been impossible for this to happen. Right. And then she saw that promise come true in, in Isaac. She saw all this happen. Hagar had a front row seat to all of this stuff. But I guarantee you, even experiencing all that, it did not make the heat of the desert sun any less hot. Oh, yeah. And it did not make the dryness of her mouth and throat any less bearable. It did not make it any easier to watch her son, her only son, watch the life ebb from his body as he succumbed to, to dehydration and, and almost certain death. You know, no matter all that stuff that she had seen, she felt hopeless. And she felt betrayed right up until the moment when that well appears. God must have felt totally absent. But God was not absent. God was not absent. As I said, that well was always going to be there. It reminds me of that, I said, you know, the greeting cards that just say have faith and everything will be all right. This is one that gets put on those greeting cards. Romans 8 and 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. But what people don't realize here is it does not say all things are going to be good to them that love God. <laughs> Jesus didn't even make that promise. He actually said the exact opposite. In the world, you're going to have trouble. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. But Paul says all things, not all things are good, but all things work together for good. I don't think Hagar would say there was anything good about stumbling through the wilderness. I don't think she would say there was anything good about watching her son almost die. But I think we can see how God used those things to work together for the ultimate good of her. Yeah. Saying work together for good, it leaves room for a lot of difficult stuff. It leaves room for a lot of broken dreams and sleepless nights. But because we serve a God that sees the whole story yeah. at once, and a God that wants good for His people, yeah. He sees that sometimes there are deserts that we have to walk through. Now we have a luxury that Hagar did not. We know how her story starts and we know how what the middle is and we know what the end is. She yeah. had to live through it. We get to see this story from God's point of view. Right. Once everything is already settled. Yeah, how's that point point? And if you think about it, think about how different things would have been had Hagar not had to pass through that desert. Had she not passed through the desert, there would have been no way for God to fulfill His promise to her. He had promised that Ishmael would become a great nation. But if she had stayed in Abraham's house, 
Yeah. He would have always been under the shadow of Isaac. Yeah, second fiddle. He would have always played second fiddle. He would have everything. He for the rest of his life, he would have been the low man on the totem pole. By walking into that desert, God proves to Hagar that she and her son are forever under his protection, just like he had promised. Ishmael doesn't have to grow up in the shadow of Isaac. He's allowed to go out and, and become that great nation. And, and Isaac doesn't have to grow up in a home full of bad blood where there's always that conflict between the, the real firstborn and the one who the promise is going to come through. But get, get this. Not only did going through that desert allow that promise to come true, the moment that Hagar steps outside Abraham's camp, she's a free woman. Yeah. She had spent her entire life as a slave with no way to... She had no say over her own life. She had to do what somebody else told her. When Sarah says, you're going to have a baby with Abraham, she couldn't protest. It was not up to her. But the moment that Abraham puts that bottle of water on her back and gives her that bread and sends her into the wilderness, he is effectively granting her her freedom. Yeah. So the desert, even though it was difficult, even though she almost died, when she comes out on the other side of it, She's free. Yeah. She's free to do with her life what she wants to. She's free to, to become the promise that God had given. Had she not made that journey through those dry places, she would have died a slave. But she dies the mother of a great nation and a free mother. <coughs> not everything was good in Hagar's story, but everything worked together for good. Yeah. Now, it would be foolish for us to say, you know, like I said, just have faith and everything will be fine. Deserts aren't easy to walk through. It's terrifying to see destruction coming over the horizon. But when things get scary, we can rest in the promise that God gave through the name of that firstborn son, Israel. Amen. It means God hears. God heard Hagar. God heard Ishmael. And God hears us. Over and over, I think about what Jesus says there in Matthew. He says, you can buy two sparrows for a farm. Practically worthless is what he's saying in man's eyes. You can buy sparrows all day long. But not one of those worthless animals falls to the ground that God doesn't see. Amen. Jesus says, every hair on your head is numbered. Yeah. Think about it. And don't you know that you're of far more worth than any sparrow? God heard Hagar. God heard Ishmael. Ishmael. And God hears us when we cry. And how great a promise is that to be able to rest in even when the desert looks dry. Thank you. You know what? I, I wouldn't touch that for nothing. But I was thinking when Zach was teaching, he brought out a he brought out a lot of interesting points that that I hadn't thought about before and kind of shed new light. You're here this morning. Maybe you was like me. God is calling you for work. God is calling you to save your soul. You say, well, I just can't do it. Yeah. You know, uh, as Zach was talking, God knows the ending. You know, God was called, is calling you and he called me. He knew. He knew that I was going to mess up. Yeah. yeah. He knew that I was not going to live a perfect life. He knew that I was going to make mistakes. Like Zach said, he knew the outcome. 
He knows tomorrow. Yeah. He knows the next day. He knows the next day. He, he made man, Bobby, in his own image. And before he knew man, he knew that they was going to mess up. Yeah. He knew that they was going to need a Savior. He knew that he was going to have to give his only son. And he made him anyway. He called me, and he's calling you. He's calling you, and he knows that you're going to mess up. He knows that you're going to make mistakes. He wants you anyway. He's still calling you. He knows the outcome. He knows he's got a plan for you. Even though that you think I'm not worthy, mm -hmm. no one is. That's right. Even though you think I just can't do it, no, you can't. But you can in Him. If they get a song together this morning, I want you to think about that. God knows tomorrow and He knows next day. And He loves it. He loves us in spite. Oh, yeah. He loves us in spite of ourselves. He loves us in spite of all that we've done. He still loves us. And he wants to save you this morning. And you're, maybe you're here, maybe you're already give your heart to the Lord. You just feel like, man, I, I just can't, I just can't do it. Yeah, yeah, you can. Just hold on. Just hold on. God knows. God knows tomorrow. You don't know tomorrow. If you give up, the song said, if you give up today, it won't come tomorrow if you give up today. Why don't you come this morning? Why don't you come and let God take over? Let Jesus in your heart. Let Him be that whale that Sarah couldn't see. Why don't you come? Like the one at the window I was
Yeah.